Lumber for the Spencer Lumber Company and grain for Worth Murr Feeds and Dwight Proctor's Eastern State Feeds and shingles for Frank McQuaid's roofing supply business. I thought that the steam engine was beautiful. I can remember it was coal black with a plaque affixed under the engineer's window stating the year that the engine was built. It was 1917 and it belonged to the Boston and Albany Railroad. After the engineer would drop his freight cars and tracks to pick up the empty cars, I would watch with excitement as the firemen would start to open the would open the boiler door and shovel coal into the hopper, and the iron horse would start to back down the track to the main line in South Spencer. The biggest thrill would be when the engineer would blow the steam whistle and both the engine and the fireman would wave to me. Pleasant memories from so long ago. Towards the end of 1932, an operating plan was established to nurture Sivan Specialty Shop into a reality. My, my mother would stay in the store and my father would travel to some of the outlying towns and pedal clothes out of a car. About that time, my Uncle Nathan decided to leave the fledgling business and try his luck at finding a job in New York City. Uncle Nathan will appear a little later in this story. Let's get back to my father, the ex-dress manufacturer from New York, becoming a peddler. I don't think my father was too anxious to become a peddler, but my mother said that if my father would not go on the road, she would. Would that threat, threat dad, was to become a, dad was to become a peddler, but it was not to be that easy. My father neither knew how to drive nor did he own a car. My father purchased a 1926 Dodge Brothers touring car. Now let me tell you what a touring car was. A touring car had a roof, but there were wind but where the windows would be was nothing but open sides. In the winter you attached curtains from the top of the doors to the roof. Now that the business had a car, my father had to learn to drive it. My father came, when my father came to Spencer, he found a man by the name of Mr. Cragen. My father had served in the 306th Infantry in France in World War I with Mr. Cragen. All I know about, all I know other than then that my father and Mr. Cragen were army buddies, that he was a bachelor and he was a streetcar motor man and that he drank too much. With Mr. Cragen's help, Grandpa learned to drive and after six tries, my father was issued a license and he started his road business. He sold clothes out of his car to Barry, Gilbertville, Palmer Villages and Warren. He was a peddler for the rest of his working days. I think he enjoyed it very much. When we mentioned the getting of the license after six tries, on the sixth try he did get his license. He dro was driving up Pleasant Street with a brand new license in his pocket from what I am told and he had an accident. He had had a license for maybe about an hour. But the sad part of it is the person he had hit was the registry inspector that had given him the license those days he didn't lose it all. The registry inspector said was, boy, I'm sorry I ever gave you a license. But as the years went on, he did improve somewhat in his driving. Not a heck of a lot, but he improved somewhat. I, I have been told that when Sivens was first established that my mother used babysitters. I had a few sitters, but, but I'm told one of the best was a teenager by the name of Blanche Carbonell. Blanche later married Carl Berger, and for a number of years, they a num and a, a number of years later they started Berger Oil Company. Berger Carl 
has been deceased for about 20 years. But Blanche Berger is still alive in her 80s. I still buy fuel oil to heat our house from the Berger Company, though it belongs to E.T. Smith, a large Worcester oil dealer. Let's go up Cherry Street in the early 1930s. I'm going to tell you where we lived and some of the people who lived in our neighborhood. We lived at 48 Cherry Street. The house still stands. It is the second house east of Ash Street on the south side of the street. The house belonged at the time to the Spencer Savings Bank. I would assume it must have, it most likely been part of a Depression era foreclosure. I don't remember what the inside of the apartment looked like, but I do remember that there were two beautiful pines standing, one on each side of the front walk. I believe the, one of the pine trees became victims of the 1938 hurricane. But 70 years later, if you go up Cherry Street and look at 48 Cherry, one of the pine trees is still standing. We lived on the first floor. On the second floor lived Frank Kimball and his wife Florence and two sons. Paul, about a year younger than my brother Bob, and Lawrence, a red-headed kid with a Dutch cut, was about a year younger than I was. Frank Kimball was employed as a farmhand in Sibley Farm. Sibley Farms was located where Ragsdale Chevrolet is today. Florence Kimball, I am told by Jane Gray, is still very much alive and in her 90s. On the third floor, Mr. and Mrs. Buster Shambo occupied the third floor at 48 Cherry Street. Buster and his wife were childish, childless, not childless, and he earned his living on a door-to-door -door residential bread route for the Wholesome Bread Company. The house below us on the corner of Ash Street belonged to Walt the Prouty. Walt the Prouty served as treasurer of the Spencer Savings Man Bank. On the second floor lived Mr. and Mrs. Tripp, the retired Spencer Postmaster, and their daughter, Eleanor. Eleanor, I remember, as being in her 20s and always wearing riding apparel. The house on the other stride of us belonged to Mrs. Mary Porter. Mrs. Porter was considered by many to be the richest person in town. Her husband had made a fortune in Oklahoma in the oil fields in the early part of the 20th century. She shared her home with her sister Emma Birch and her full-time maid Myrtle. Mrs. Porter, I was also told, was the biggest contributor to the occasional trip. Upon teaching, it was said that she left over a million dollars to her child. I don't know if it is true, but she was a very wealthy lady. As a three-year-old kid, I used to visit her sister, Mrs. Birch, who was quite sickly. On her death, she willed me a picture of a Dutch boy that still hangs in Dorothy's in my bedroom. As a little kid, visiting my friend, Mrs. Birch, I used to admire that picture. Mrs. Birch also willed my brother Bob the Bible that her father carried as a soldier in the Union Army in the Civil War. When we come back again for the next program, we will take up where I left off on the other side of Cherry Street and cover a little more of the town and some, talk about some of the people. I hope you enjoyed this program. And again, if anyone would like to comment on it, my email address is m7, m-c-i-v-i-n, all one word, at americaonline.com. Uh, please, the only thing I would ask is please put memories in the subject line just so I'll know what it's about. And uh, 
if you disagree with anything or there's something you want to add, I'd like to hear from you. Be looking forward to giving you another story in a week or two. Thank you very much. There's a town in New England With a pond on the north end In a dusty old dead end Where my Marie lives And at night when the stars glow I stand by the window And wonder what more Could this life ever bring There's a boat by the old dock, a slow-moving wall clock, and a front door left unlocked, should neighbors drop by. For a beer on the back porch, talk of the day's work, and a song from Marie at the blink of an eye. There's a waltz for the seasons, tunes for the times, they all seem to be passing by. When I hear Marie sing an old-fashioned love song, life becomes still, like the moon on the hill. Watching the trouble clouds fly I, I've got a red at a run A new garden up back And an old army knapsack Full of songs I call mine But Marie, she's the singer when friends come over, harmonies lift through the oak and... <laughs>